Hello, and welcome to Book Reviews Kill, a podcast about fantasy, sci-fi, and horror novels. I'm Evan. And I'm Chad. And you're joining us today for our recap and discussion of Wolves of the Kala, book five in the Dark Tower series by Stephen King. All right. All right. All right. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. 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 I'm okay. just going to start right off the bat here and say, this is definitely my personal least favorite book in this series. Uh, but even saying that, it's still got its share of high points and foreshadowing for the rest of the story. But in, in my mind, it's the sort of bridge book between the relative normalcy of books one through four and the fever dream that is the last two in this series. So, I mean, that's just my thing. Chad, what are your thoughts so far on this? I'm honestly kind of relieved to hear you say that because I know that me and you kind of line up on what we like and what we don't like in books quite a bit. And to hear you say that, it kind of gives me like hope for the rest of them because this one was definitely my least favorite. Like there were every other book that I've read, I'm stoked to read it. Like I'll get done doing something else. and I'm like, oh, yes, I get to go read Dark Tower. And this one was more of like a I need to go read Dark Tower. <laughs> it felt a little bit more like work to you. Yeah, yeah, you know, in Star Trek, occasionally they have like a um, like a time warp episode or they get stuck in some sort of like, <laughs> like, it's just sort of, uh, you know, uh, some little pocket of space time dimension or something and they have to escape it. And it's definitely like a filler episode. They just kind of like ran out of ideas like time for a timey one. That's what I felt this book was kind of. It was like a why... Is how much is this tale, this encounter with this whole village situation and the wolves and their overcoming of said wolves, even mean to the story overall, you know? So that's the thing is, um, since I've read this already once, looking back on it, a lot more in this book made a lot more sense to me. So it was a little okay. bit more enjoyable this time around for me. It was still, my even on my second read, it was still my least favorite of the uh, of the seven I mean, it's, it's funny because a lot of people think that Song of Susanna is the weakest one, and I would disagree personally, but I see why. But, you know, looking back on some one, of this right? stuff, yeah, totally. To be fair, like, there's some great conversations in here. Uh, there's a yeah. few really vividly drawn scenes, like Jake hiding from Andy the robot and Ben <laughs> Sleitman in the Dogen. That was really good, really suspenseful. Uh, Susanna being overtaken by Mia and eating live animals to Dude, feed that was Cap. Dis- that was pretty bad. <laughs> I was I was eating dinner yeah. while yeah. eating while reading that and it was so visceral really and like uh, it was just disgusting and the way it was described was just like ugh. her like crawling through the swamp with like no legs like all covered in mud and just like consuming <laughs> like things around and and, like, everything munching yeah. frogs just oh man it was just but you're right there was a deepening of relationship between the characters in these books and seeing how cuz they were kind of divided well, they were their quartet was broken for a little bit of it, but not too much of it. They were pretty unified, but physically they were divided. And so like each group, well, each kind of, you know, I guess the only group being Eddie and Susanna, but everyone was kind of divided, staying with different people, building different relationships, and they had a different role to play. And it was kind of cool to see each one be an operator independently of the others, which I thought was kind of a cool thing, though. I didn't I, I don't know if it needed 800 pages to <laughs> describe it to us, but, you know. It was still cool. I mean, we get to see some more of Roland's personality shine through. That scene where he's dancing uh, in particular is pretty cool. Also, in particular, yeah. his ability to lead and plan battles. Um, he's he's even more personable in this book. And Yeah, and his humility is coming to yeah, show. To yeah, bear, like you know? the, other, the other characters kind of shine all the brighter as a result. But yeah, let's just uh, let's get right into the intro or the uh, the recap here, and then we can talk about some of the finer points here. I'm just excited that we've. I mean, this is kind of in my mind like the hump of the series, and everybody's got their own opinions about what where that hump is. But we've reached the Wednesday of the tale. I mean, I think we have. I think that Song of Susanna is a blast. It's it's a, it's like one of the most well paced books in my opinion, and then the Dark Tower Seven, the Dark Tower is just bonkers it's a lot it's a whole i'm i am so in for it i'm ready and like you know as much as i may complain about some of the pacing or just like the boringness of this one i am really excited to move on to the next books because this whole series has been just just wild and fun and great and an excellent like tour through the mind of stephen king and just uh just been fun. So I'm, I'm in it. You know, if you hear me complain, keep it, uh, take it with a grain of sand, salt, whatever, because uh, I do really like these series. All right. So let's get right into the recap. Let's do it. 
After leaving the Emerald City, Roland Deschain and his quartet approach Kala Bryn Sturgis on their way to Thunderclap. Eddie Dean and Jake Chambers are taken to New York in a dreamlike state called Todash, while Roland follows Susanna in her new split personality Mia as she crawls through a swamp and feeds on live animals to nurture her growing child. While in the Todash state, Eddie and Jake discover that the rose in the vacant lot is in trouble. While in the Manhattan restaurant of the mine, they see Calvin Tower, the man who owns the vacant lot, being pressured by Jack Andalini and Enrico Balazar into selling it to the Sombra Corporation. A group of people has been observing the quartet from a distance, and a former priest named Donald Callahan comes to talk with them. Roland, Jake, Eddie and Susanna learn that roughly every 23 years, the Kalas are raided by wolves, robotic soldiers that serve the Crimson King. These wolves steal half the Kalas' children and bring them to Thunderclap. Upon their return a few months later, the children are ruined. Ruined or ruined children are sterile, mentally handicapped, grow larger and stronger than any other children, and finally die in immense pain at a young age. After their first night in Calabrin Sturgis, Roland, Susanna, and Eddie hear Father Callahan's story. After fleeing Salem's lot, Callahan arrived in New York as a vagrant. He begins killing the vampires he can sense living in New York City after his close friend is attacked. This attracts the attention of the Crimson King and his soldiers, the Kentoi. He first notices this attention when he sees graffiti and lost pet posters that refer to him. The Hitler brothers are hired to find Callahan. When they finally find the priest, they attack and carve a cross on his forehead, intending it to become a swastika. Callahan is rescued by Calvin Tower and Aaron Deepnow before they can finish, and Callahan is left with a cross carved into his forehead. After this, Callahan is lured into a building by Richard Sayre, a low man, and several vampires. Rather than be infected, he jumps out a window and dies. After his death, he wakes up in the way station, where he encounters Walter O'Dim. The man in black gives Don Black 13, which transports him to the doorway cave outside Colobrin Sturgis, where he begins a new life seeking redemption by preaching his religion to the locals. As Roland prepares Colibrin Sturgis and his quartet for battle against the wolves, he realizes that the rose and the vacant lot must be protected. Eddie travels through the door in Doorway Cave with the aid of Black 13 and arrives just in time to prevent Andalini from torturing Tower. Eddie warns Tower that Balazar will send men after him and urges Tower to flee New York. Tower refuses to leave until he sends some of his most precious books back to Roland's world for safekeeping, but in the end, he relents and leaves. Preparation for the wolves' arrival is complicated by the presence of traitors in the Kala. The robot, Andy, and Ben Sleitman, the elder, the father of Jake's new friend. These traitors communicate with Finley Otego through the Dogon, an outpost made by North Central Positronics. Before the wolves come, Andy is confronted and deactivated, and Ben Sleitman promises to help on the day of the attack. On the day the wolves arrive, the quartet is joined by several sisters of Ariza. Jake, the Tavery twins, and Ben Sleitman the younger create a false path, leading to where the children of the village are supposed to be hiding. Matters become more complicated when the Tavery boy breaks his ankle. The group of children is slowed down and cannot make it back to safety. They are forced to hide in the trench where Roland waits to ambush the wolves. The wolves are defeated with the help of the quartet, but not before Margaret Eisenhart and Ben Sleitman the Younger are killed. The battle won, Susanna's personality is overtaken by Mia, and she escapes via the doorway cave with Black 13 during the celebration festivities. There, Callahan discovers a copy of the novel, Salem's Lot, causing him to question his reality. The novel ends with the quartet, unsure of how to follow Susanna back to New York City, though Roland and Eddie are steadfast in their resolve to save her. Whew. That was uh, 
that was a lot and a little all at the same time. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, that's a pretty good way of putting it, actually. It's just a, it's a whole bunch, um, but, you know, not not really that much. Yeah, like the summary was kind of short, and I feel like it didn't really leave anything out, though. But at the I same mean, time, there was still so much out, but, that yeah. happened. Um, I've got some questions here for you. My first question is, were you disappointed when you found out that the wolves were just robots? A little. We've had so many robots that I was kind of, it made sense. But yeah, totally. I was like, ah, you know, I would have loved to have a little bit more, uh, like more, I don't know, more meaty of a, of a assailant. <laughs> yeah. That conversation Eddie had with the old Jeffords guy was really cryptic and mysterious. It, even though that, that conversation, that story that the old man tells is of like his time as being a young man when the wolves attacked. That was great. I thought that yeah. was really interesting. It was super fun. And then Eddie tells Roland about the knowledge that he gains, but not the reader. So it's setting a lot up, or at least it feels that way. And then it's, I don't know, for me personally, it's just like kind of a letdown, but also interesting at the same time. I don't know. I had mixed feelings on it. It's good that when the wolves get there, they've got a way to kind of easily defeat them because they've got the little like antenna things on their heads yep. and things like that. But it also felt like kind of, eh, eh. All right. It was like reused That's, almost. Yeah, reused like he was is a recycling good recycling yeah. old material almost. Like when um when Eddie tells Roland of that tale and then Roland says something and he's like, "Oh, it's okay." And then he's talking to somebody else and he's like, "We know how to deal with this. My cotet has dealt with it before." And I stopped to be like, "Okay, what is it?" And yeah. I was like, I was convinced that it wasn't going to be robots because it was too obvious. I was like, "No, it's not going to be <laughs> robots for sure." And then, you know, it was, which was fine. You know, I, I, you don't need to be like making new bad guys all the time, but I feel like with they the amount kind of, of built worlds up. and places that plays here at play here, it could have been, you know? Yeah. It was a little built up. Yeah. Just a little bit. Totally. And like the lightsabers, I feel like he just threw that in there for like no reason. And then didn't all. do anything with it. Nothing. Like, why didn't any of them pick up? Like, Eddie knows what a lightsaber is. Right. At least He's one from of them the should 80s. like be moving on in the story with a lightsaber as a sword I now i thought that was so weird like through do a throwaway line like they don't work unless they're in their hands or something like that yeah so let's uh we, we're kind of dancing around this and it's a very big part of the story uh one thing i wasn't a huge fan of on my first read through but kind of really understood on my second read through and enjoyed a little bit more this time was um uh, callahan's story it was kind of broken up into two sections kind of what did you think about that i liked it I kind of like honestly some of the stories being told by other people were some of my favorite parts of this whole book if not my favorite parts in the whole book I I was kind of confused though because he mentions um the vampires really casually and then the what are the men the the young men the the low men the low the, men the that's right the different tiers of vampires like the level one level two level three vampires and stuff like that when this story refers to a vampire what is it exactly referring to um so in salem like salem's lot is about a vampire that comes to a small town and chaos ensues basically like an actual vampire yeah and father okay. callahan like donald callahan is the main character well not the he's like one of the very main characters of salem's lot and the book does end with uh i'm not gonna like spoil anything but the book ends basically with callahan leaving right and so callahan's story in these books is is picking up after the end of Salem's Lot. And oh, we probably should have read Salem's Lot before this, but we don't, you don't have to, but it would have helped you quite a bit, probably. Totally, because it's thrown in there with like very little explanation. Yeah, um, it is kind of, you know, and I read Salem's Lot before I read The Dark Tower, so I already knew what was up, but I didn't really think about that when we. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> but it would like, have I mean, taken us a while to read Salem's totally. Lot. It's easier for and me like, to just explain with this it conversation. To you. Yeah. With this conversation, it's totally explained to me, so it's fine. Um, I would say if there's any one book so far that has been like, you know, there's so many references to like other stories yeah. throughout these, but if there's been one of them that would have actually aided in the understanding as opposed to just like a cool, like, oh, that's a fun Easter egg, um, I think Salem's Lot would probably be it for anyone out there who's wanting to like really yeah. marinate in this uh, story. 
Yeah, like but, I mean, Captain Trips from the Stand is in Wizard and Glass, and that's that's a that's a nod to the Stand, but you don't need to know everything that happened in the Stand for that. Uh, There's like okay. that note that somebody finds on a windshield wiper that's kind of like giving directions to for people to go meet people in Nebraska, and like the 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 man is in the West and all that stuff, and yeah. that's fun for people that have read the Stand. But yeah, I totally agree with you that um, Salem's Lot is it's pretty important or at least it's more important than it would be to read the stand. But yeah, essentially uh, Callahan is now seeing and like sensing other vampires around him. Um, that whole story was really cool. It, it's got that kind of Stephen King flair, you know, you've got like this kind of vagrant dude who's kind of on the run from vampires and it's a very neat story. Um, you know, the vampires have their, their whole system of trying to catch him through like these, wanted posters and things like that and right really like graffiti and yeah i mean the only thing that i i'm not a big fan of about it is that you know we've kind of got like, with wizard and glass it's like this big 600 page long story right and then we get into this and then now we're being introduced to this entirely new town again even though that already happened once in wizard and glass a now new we've cast got, yeah now we've got like uh you know essentially not not the same story but it's a you know it's roland plotting for this eventual battle that they're gonna have to be in with his quartet and everything and then there's like the kind of inner machinations of the town and roland's personal life uh kind of flared into all of this and so it's a lot of the same thing over the course of like 1500 pages of <laughs> book you know uh, and so yeah. callahan's story it's like another kind of just left turn away from the the kind of a story that's going on here mm -hmm. like the main story like roland and Susanna and eddie and jake and oi don't really cover that much ground if you think about it very from, little yeah from um like physically and figuratively from the end of the wastelands to the end of this book they don't even get to end world they get to the border of end world yeah. And I guess Jake crosses over into it when he uh, takes his little trip over, which is one of the coolest scenes which we'll talk about here in a minute. But um, yeah, so it seems a little almost inconsistent kind of because remember before they hit the big city, Jake asking like, why didn't we stop to help them more? And they're like, well, once you do one thing, you know, you know, give a mouse a cookie sort of thing. We're going to be here forever because we'll be helping them for all their things. And then on this one, I guess all it takes is them being like, you are honor bound to help us and we need your help. And then he's like, ah, you're right. And don't even dare yeah. suggest that you pay us for our work because that's not how this works. Like, I don't know. It just seemed like I get the honor thing, but it seemed like definitely a major and time consuming distraction on their mission to prevent like what I can only assume be the crumbling of all space time everywhere, you know? Yeah, that's really valid, but I'm going to completely uh, set all of that to rights for you right now. Okay. So one reason, one of the main reasons they're doing this, um, and I think that it's hinted at that Callahan would give it to them anyway, but they seem to be a little bit motivated because of Black 13. Black 13 is the way that they're going to be able to get back to these two different timelines in New York. They have to get first back into the 60s to recover Susanna's money so that they can pay off, or at least that's their plan, right? Right. Um, it's going to, that plan's not really going to... Anyway, um, Work out so great. Yeah, <laughs> we'll see. But uh, they also need to get back um, again to pay off uh, the Sombra Corporation or whatever. And so what like, is Black 13? It's the like, like, it's, it's one of the balls in, in uh, Merlin's rainbow. You know what I mean? Okay, There's like so a it's bunch the of thirteenth, like Palantir or whatever. It's the black one, yeah. Like in the, the okay. Wizarding Glass, it was like the ruby one or the pink one or whatever, the grapefruit. You know, um, so there's thirteen of them, and the black one is Got like it. the okay. most intense one. It's the it's the oh my god, you know. Um, so that's one of the reasons is that uh, Callahan is essentially like, I'll let, I'll give this to you if you help us out. You know, um, I think that Callahan says something along the lines of like, I would have given it to you anyway, but that's one yeah. of them. Um, another thing is that. I think that when they're in um, River Crossing in book three, when Jake asks Eddie why they didn't help them out, Eddie's answer was pretty correct. River Crossing situation wasn't as dire right. as it this was is. Way like, different. Yeah, like this is a pretty extreme situation. And I would also say they weren't quite caught tet and they weren't quite gunslingers True. back in the wastelands either. So like now I feel like Roland 
uh, after telling his story about his previous quartet, especially, I think that some unconscious part of Roland knows that this is another turning of the wheel of Ka. This is the, another quartet of his. Maybe he can do some things better. Maybe, you know what I mean? Like, I think yeah. like, this is like, it's like a test almost of like how yeah. close knit this, this quartet really is. Um, and, and the stakes are so much higher. You know, they didn't pause to like help them chop wood. No, in rivers no. crossing, but like this one, their children are all being so like it's a very different scenario. Totally. So that's at least how I'm looking at it. Because you're right. I mean, there is a little bit of inconsistency there. Because you'd think that Roland would just be like, "Nope, we got to do all of this." But right at the same time, like gunslingers deal in lead. You know what I mean? Like gunslingers are not only just like these badass knights. They're they're like deputies. You know what I mean? They're they're right. uh, investigators. They're detectives and peacekeepers and stuff like that so yeah their honor is kind of like being called in um i like that conversation between uh callahan and roland when they finally meet in the, or that when they first initially meet uh in the in the woods or whatever outside of calabrin sturgis and then they bring like overholes are in and everything and mm-hmm. every time they're kind of like moving the conversation towards like okay so when we do this and roland's just like no 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 no, we haven't agreed to shit yet right like we <laughs> like, we are really still in palaver stage yeah totally <laughs> yeah good old palaver um, dude palaver is used hundreds it's like a, i almost feel it's like a like a like a cultural thing or it's like branding as part of this book series you know okay so in that in that vein um so i've read like 40 Stephen King books or something. Yeah. And so one thing that I've noticed that Stephen King does all the time in his books is he always does this. He always calls back frequently to something super specific. He does it a lot mm. in, in his books and it could be anything. It could be just like the way something looks or one thing that someone said that someone can't stop thinking about it. But he always does this like callback to something extremely specific. And it usually doesn't really annoy me i wish i had a specific or well articulated reason for saying this but you know the near constant mentioning of someone saved my life tonight that really was annoying to me in this book i was Mm. over it uh we get it king like you can stop talking about it and he does that a lot in his writing um and it usually doesn't bother me and sometimes it sort of enhances the flow of the story but in this particular case yeah, well, you know, you got it with like 19. They won't stop talking about the number 19, but that's really right. important. Like, it's super important. To the like, point they're like finding 19s like everywhere, whether or not they are actual demarcations of Providence. But yeah, I mean, it turns out to and be so very important. And so is someone saved my life tonight. Like, all of it's important, right? But he kind of like beats you over the head with it sometimes. It's like, dude, yeah. like, oh my God, this is like the, the 27th time you said 19. Like, I wonder if he does it 19 times in this book. Oh my or gosh, something. that would be really interesting. <laughs> Probably not. I don't know. I have another question for you here. Okay. Did you suspect Andy the robot? So no, not really. Um, I wasn't surprised when uh, Jake is hiding and we see like Andy coming around. I was like, okay, yep, that makes sense. Like it didn't, especially since when I sat there and thought like, what could it be that they've tackled before? And it it was robots. And then I kind of had that inkling. And then they have this robot in town who's like, wildly unsuspicious like you know, playing with the kids and singing songs right and just it's a like, little bit too nice of a robot yeah and like kind of an idiot robot you know like what's your you want your fortune told like okay yeah and he has a couple conversations with eddie that are really weird you know eddie's mm-hmm. asking him specific questions and he's just like i can't do that because of the way that i was built but it, like the way that uh, king describes like the robot's eyes they look like they're laughing or whatever they it, flash yeah he's just kind of a, a sketchy robot so yeah i mean it's not super surprising the first time you read it did you were you on to him um i think if it wasn't for the conversations that eddie was having with the robot i wouldn't have suspected it at Mm. all but i mean eddie's so intuitive and like i love the chapters from eddie's perspective personally Um, me too he's like one of my favorite characters absolutely like eddie and Susanna are every time it's from one of their perspectives like they're so they're so distinct from each other. I love Susanna's way of thinking about stuff and the way that she observes things. I love the way that she makes fun of Eddie. You know, mm-hmm. like when Eddie and Overholzer are talking and Eddie like just he's rambling about something and he kind of like drifts back a little bit and Susanna's just like, ah, he's just always like that. He's just You're talks right. so, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's just how he is. Yeah. They're so funny, but they're so in love too. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, Eddie is so shaken up by the end of this book. Um 
what did you think about the whole like Roland knowing Susanna is pregnant with the chap and the Mia situation, his deciding not to tell Eddie about it until a certain point. Did you think that that point came early enough? Do you think he should have told him earlier? What do you, what do you think about all that? I think honesty is always the best policy in these sort of things. And it's been treating them really well throughout this entire time. And in fact, in previous podcasts, I've mentioned it's like the thing that I really like applaud them all for is like the moment that Roland's like, I'm going crazy. Take my guns. Like they're very honest with each other and i've been stoked up till this book that there hasn't that there hasn't been any sort of like interpersonal lack of trust where like the conflict in the book is created by like shifty eyes and like unsuspect or suspecting and untrusting the fellow members of the quartet i did like how it was portrayed in this like it was done in a very like cool way that jake realized like we're not quartet anymore and then he immediately tells roland and then roland's like i must apologize to you jake and then they like go about fixing things and it's they kind of all come back together so it was done well um they could kind of no. tell that things were dissolving a little bit yeah, yeah yeah and they need to be strong in order to face not only this immediate threat and this situation but what definitely what's going to come and uh but no you know i to answer your initial question i didn't like the fact that Roland didn't tell Eddie right away and he was just like, uh, he can't like handle it or something. I don't know. It was just like, no, nah, man, he can. And if there's anyone who's like earned it, it's yeah. the fellow members of your quartet time well, and, and time Eddie again. does handle it pretty well, too. Yeah. Like Roland was wrong not to tell him like earlier. Totally. You know, Eddie would have handled it just fine. Um, I mean, at least in my opinion, like maybe there's some reason that I'm missing why yeah. it was a good idea for him not to. But I didn't see it. I have a question for you here. Was yeah. it the – am I correct in my understanding that it was the man in black who was helping Susanna at the end get away? Or I guess it was Maya? Because someone – she had assistance. Someone provided her with a new chair. Oh, that was um, that was Andy the robot. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, Andy, but didn't they have him captured before he would be able yeah, to do but he that? Was able, no, he was able to do it initially or before, oh, okay. beforehand. Yeah. Um, okay, so he's. Then, I wonder who's working, who both Andy and all the wolves are working for. Um, the Crimson King. But who the hell is that? Yeah, that's something. I mean, I the man in black. <laughs> no, I can't. I can't get quite into that right now. Okay. Okay. Because Ben Slightman, the Elder, is working for the wolves, who are working with the Crimson King, right? And like that's all. So they're trying to like divide this whole quartet up and everything okay you know, yeah the end the I whole guess end the crimson sequence King is odd part is just very kind of casually mentioned because i didn't really like latch well, on well, to well, him don't worry about it right now okay okay <laughs> just know that the crimson king is behind a lot of all this nefarious okay stuff he's up there on. clapping and thunderclap which is like a place and i'm very curious as to what that is and where it is and what it is at all like yeah, I mean, as much as I love Song of Susanna, I'm really excited to get through Song of Susanna so we can just get right into the seventh book because that's when yeah. everything starts popping off and gets fucking just <laughs> so wild. <laughs> it's such a crazy book. Um, yeah, one thing that uh, was pointed out, I was reading some uh, discussions about this series on Reddit because I, I subscribe to the uh, the Dark Tower subreddit. And somebody of said, course so, you do. Yeah, somebody <laughs> said um, it's that Stephen King wrote uh, you can there's kind of like a interesting like divide between books five six and seven and books one two three and four mm. and it's a tone thing right um and you're going to notice it as we keep reading the rest of these books one two three and four all had quite a bit of time between them and then five six and seven were all written pretty quickly like really quickly re relative to how long the other ones took Right. Like as far as and, like like not time in the story, but time that Stephen King took to right, write the next exactly. one. Okay, got yeah. It, got um, it. So the tone of five, six, and seven, it the, like five, six, and seven kind of feel like one big book almost. Okay. Um, as far as the the writing, um, and then one, two, three, and four all have like their very distinct personalities to them. Right, because, and that makes sense because there's so many years between them. He's right. like a total different stage of his life. Yeah, Stephen he's King like was a different yeah. person. Um, so. Uh, speaking mm. of Stephen King, um, I knew we were going to end up talking a lot about Stephen King because he's one of my favorite authors and because we're reading his series. What do you think about 
taking it a step further and talking about Stephen King writing himself into these books. Oh my now. god! It's like he learned the word meta and just like had to throw it in there or something. He's like, oh, I love that. I'm gonna do that. And yeah. like he like there's a couple Stephen King books I believe in Tower's Trunk, you know, and like the lack of curiosity sometimes that his characters have, I find to be a bit unbelievable. Like, so there's this whole trunk of books and like multiple times they find things within that trunk that like is very meaningful. Like a book that has a picture of the church that's in the town. And like, there's all sorts of things that they find in there that they're like, wow, this is crazy. And then they will deal with that later. And I guess they have a lot in their hands, but like, I would not be able to rest until. I mean, it trips out Callahan, right? When they find the, um, yeah, he Salem's freaks out lot because he's just like, this is literally about me. Like, what's going on? <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to try to talk about this without getting too much into what's going to happen in the next couple of books. But I personally think that it's genius. I think it's, and one of the reasons that I think that Stephen King writing himself into these books is genius is because what what are these books about? You know, what I mean? like these books are they're about all time and all places. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and totally. so, like, what better way to break down the fourth wall that, in my opinion, needs to be broken down for us yeah. to get that next dimension that we really need for these books? I think it's absolutely brilliant. Um, in fact, seen... I would love it if they progress or accomplish something because they read a book about their story. With you know, like that would be a really cool, like story element. Yeah. Um, it would be and I mean it's it's just it's it sucks to see sentiment around these books sometimes where I can agree with a bunch of different things where I can totally disagree and that's totally fine but one thing I will not stand for is people <laughs> saying that Stephen King is like a hack for doing this oh, or that he no. had no it was like this self-indulgent thing it's like dude like he could have done this in any of the 30 books that he wrote before like I think he's right. doing it for a reason it's important to him. It's important to the to story. He's trying to bring in like, all universes yeah, everywhere and even all ours, time. Even ours. Even ours. So yes, let's exactly. go. He's let's, bringing it home. I love it. Well, like, it would who's... be self-indulgent would be like J.K. Rowling writing in herself as like <laughs> the most powerful wizardess who like witch who like saves the planet or something. You know, it's like, okay. Surprised again, she didn't. I know, me too. But like... <laughs> But like this, just I didn't find this. tweeting yeah <laughs> thank god for the witch rowling <laughs> uh but no this wasn't self-indulgent this was a element of the of the story to bring home the fact that it this this story truly encompasses everything and it is in fact greater than steven now all that being said Let's see how silly it gets, and we'll talk about it more. Okay, <laughs> okay. I'm not, like, I'm not it just might get totally a little writing Stephen King dick all the time. You know what I mean? Right, like there's right. some there's some stuff about uh, this book in particular, honestly, that that really do like it. They, they rub me the wrong way. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just hope we don't see Stephen King. Like, I hope he's not a character in this series. Like, I, maybe like one he can be like one like conversation or something but like i hope he doesn't like join the quartet or something you know what did you think so, about the very last part just of the book smiles at me <laughs> um okay honestly i thought it was a little disappointing it was just a it was like a firework show and and a really short one it was just like bang boom bang awesome done and then it was like great and then we solve this problem we don't get any chance to rest or like kind of celebrate with the townsfolk um we maya or susanna yeah. just immediately goes off and like i don't know it just seemed like it could have been a little bit more drawn out or like done in a way that was just like i don't know more fulfilling kind of didn't it didn't end very fulfilling and like jake's friend is dead but his like his pos father somehow gets to keep going on like i don't know it just seemed so i'm going to attack this from two different angles just to kind of satisfy myself here because i okay. love the sound of my own voice so um, me too <laughs> so uh i hear you the battle at the end is really short-lived it feels a little bit anticlimactic there's two possibilities here one of them is that uh king wrote in a really cool way and he you know he he meant it to be like this bigger picture thing that Roland had kind of mentioned he had he had referenced this earlier in the book he says you know battles are short-lived things and they take a lot of preparation but they right, go by like really quickly seconds, yeah. right and then and that and then that comes true later and it's a it's a learning experience for the quartet and everything like that 
or and I think that this might be a little bit more likely and we're probably not going to get Stephen King on here so I don't really mind ragging on it mm-hmm. too much but like I think what probably happened is that Stephen King got to the end of this and he was like wow that battle kind of sucked I better put something in earlier where Roland is like oh battles are really short lived you know and, battles you know, are actually really short <laughs> <laughs> I think it was it might have been him covering his ass because right, he cause... it's a lot of build up and just like a little like poof like it's just yeah. there, there it is um it's like dude it's, roland remember like at your own story that you told last book the ending sequence was like five battles and each yeah. one was long and drawn so out epic. And excellent oh so awesome yeah um i don't know it sucks because the oriza stuff like the plates and everything that was really cool super cool and it, i feel like it could have gotten a little bit more light shed on it and it could have been like a bigger moment for a lot of the people that were throwing the plates. Yeah. Uh, and it could have, it could have just been a bigger moment for everybody, but also is a battle supposed to be a big moment for people though? You know what I mean? Like, right. maybe, or is every battle supposed to be a big moment? I think is the question, right? right I mean, right. it's like maybe, some of them are just battles. Right. Exactly. And, um, I mean, we still have consequences of this one. There's still some character growth there. I mean, I think Jake, we should just talk about Jake, honestly. Jake I th- experienced I, the most growth. I think this. Jake was the best character in this whole book. Uh, I Straight like up. Eddie the most, and I love Susanna, but Jake, um, God, like Jake going off by himself and going and investigating, putting himself in danger. My and good then, Lord. And also seeing his earlier self in the very beginning of the book and like the comparison there was really great. I loved that. Mm-hmm. Like, like Eddie notices it, Jake notices it, you know, the kid that's in this bookstore is just like this whatever like just this little kid you know it's right. just like whatever it's just this this rosy cheek totally clean and nice clothes just wandering right. Jake's around still like what 11 12 I think he's in 11 this book. yeah 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 not, so he's I mean, still he's very not, young you know like in his in like mentally he's not he's like 20, totally you know yeah i mean he's he's seen too much he's been through too much but there is that really cool conversation that that roland and jake have um and it's more of like a it's a lot of like internal dialogue for roland obviously but when roland when jake says he wants to go play with ben Slyman the younger and stay at his house and stuff roland kind of has a moment where he's like if i tell him no now he's gonna agree with me and it's he's gonna have all these feelings about it i need to say yes to this like this is it's right. really important that i let this kid be a kid because if not, I'm going to strip him away. I'm going to strip all of that away. And not only is that bad, but the fact that he would be cool with it is even worse. You know, right? Uh, that's a that was a really well done part, in my opinion. Yeah, and kind of a um, indicator that Roland is, you know, he's not a parent, but he's kind of coming into his relationship and his authority over Jake and his guidance of him. Like, you know, I'm not a parent, but I've been told like by my parents that you know, when raising a kid, you kind of gotta kind of got to trust them enough to let them fail on their own. You can't always protect them. And as they continue to kind of prove themselves to you, their trustworthiness, you kind of expand and widen the range of what you allow them to do and be like, yes, now I trust you with this. Now I trust you with this. And if they make mistakes, like, you know, you can't always be there to fix it for them or to prevent them from making that mistake. They need to make it on their own and then learn the lesson from it. And Roland was kind of showing his wisdom and his, um, his evolution as a like caretaker of Jake and letting him kind of do his own thing and go out there and put himself out there and succeed or fail, you know, regardless of the outcome. I want to be better for the entire situation if they all split up and got a lay of the land too. I totally. mean, like them constantly only being with each other in a place that's not being attacked. That's not, you know, I mean, right. why not? You know? Right. And it proved for way for the, um, their benefit because Jake was able to discover, um, the betrayal of his friend and, uh, his friend's father, you know, there's a, I have to say also, I just like the fact that throughout this very stressful, harrowing tale of Roland, he like in multiple books finds different love interests, <laughs> you know, like he's laid. just, yeah, he's yeah. just like a man's man, you know, and it's just funny when he, like, I'm always like, of course, of course he finds yeah. another one. The way that him and Rosalita talk is really yeah. cute. It's, it's adorable. Very cute. Yeah, I loved it. Okay, so 
Benjamin Sleitman Jr. is the author of the extremely like rare and expensive book that Mr. Tower is all about because it has some mistakes in it and that it might not even be him who wrote the book. It might be his father because of some errors within it. Who is Benjamin Sleitman Jr.? Like, again, am I like missing something? Or <laughs> Yeah, that's Jake's friend. <laughs> oh, okay, like, there's Ben okay. Sleitman the Younger and Ben Sleitman the Elder. OK, right? um, so, so that book was apparently written by one of them. Like kind of, okay, so, it, so everything has like twinners, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> okay, there's a, yeah, there's, yeah, yeah. there's alternate versions of alternate people in alternate dimensions and stuff, right? Right. Um. So there's people that have similar names. There's people that have the same names. Uh, lots of people's names have the number nineteen, or, or right. have, the, have nineteen letters in their name and things like that. So the way that I'm remembering it and the way that I think about it, it wasn't written by like literal. Ben Sleitman the Younger from like the kid Jake was playing with, but there's significance in the fact that those names are the same, hmm, you know? Okay. Like everything's connecting to everything else. You know what I mean? Right. Like, like it almost feels like, it almost feels like the more connections that are being made, the more that like time is speeding up almost. Does like, does that make sense? Like the more yeah, things that, that they're does. noticing, that's at least how I'm looking at it, you know? And to, I mean, to be totally transparent with our readers and our listeners and everything, like, I read these last three books like seven years ago, like a while ago. You you know? were on so tour, I'm like right? still trying to remember. Yeah, and I was like drunk most of the time. Yeah. So <laughs> I was like, I'm trying, I'm doing a pretty decent job of remembering. But as we get into, obviously, like this book is not too difficult, but like the next two books is a lot. It's, it gets real <laughs> convoluted. It's not really convoluted. It's just, it's just throwing a lot at you. Okay. You know? Um, yeah, so you don't, I, I think I'm I think I'm getting most of this right. But yeah. okay, I think you are too, and you don't have to <laughs> confirm or deny this. So I guess it's just more of a statement than it is a question. But I'm beginning to suspect that 19 is an indicator of perversion, that it was introduced by something other than uh, maybe God, for lack of a better term here. Like like it is a creation or a insertion of someone with ill-intended purpose or something i don't know kind of like the level the number 13 for like hotels you know they don't have a floor or something it's like anytime i get 19 it's like a oh maybe that's something that the original tower builder did not intend to be a part of his tower i won't confirm or deny anything okay because, okay um there's still a couple more books here and yeah i think i really like hearing your theories about this kind of stuff though it's cool I really like the term Dunding also. Can we talk Dunding, which is like a... Oh, Din. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Dundin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For some reason in my notes, I put a G at the end of that for Dunding, but Dundin. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a way of being like, do you agree to like do what I say and listen to me fully? You know, and it's like a cool way of being like, let us palaver in an honest and open way where we will see each other and respect each other's opinions sort of thing i just thought it was a really cool concept yeah right roland is like first among equals you know yeah it's a good way of putting it there's some really cool slang in these books that i really like quite a bit okay so eddie when he's in new york he says and almost like a disgusted tone um, because he's talking about the future of Andalini and how Andalini, he knows that he's going to be eaten by the lobstrosities. And then he's like, actually, he might not be because this is level 19 of the tower. And he just knows this to be a certainty. So like, what? OK, so I'm going to I'm really <laughs> racking my brains this time. So I'm pretty sure that there are two worlds where the dark in the Dark Tower multiverse where time can only flow in one direction. Um, and I think that one of them is uh, one of them is the keystone world and one of them is all world so roland's oh. world is is called all world right the world that the world that they're in right now you know in right. caliber and sturgis and blaine the train and all this and topeka and all this stuff right right all world and then the the keystone world gilead is, is huh a uh, gilead is in all world oh okay yeah uh, I was like, man, you are not following right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the Keystone world is like the the New York of that Eddie, Jake, and Susanna are from. You know what I mean? Um, and that's where the Rose is too. And the Rose is a twinner to the Tower. You know, um, so that that Keystone world is like that that number being is significant to those those two parallel 
Keystone Worlds, if that makes okay. sense. Okay, yes, Like, it that's is. at least the way that I remember it. So I think that, like, when Eddie says he's on the 19th level of the tower, I think that's, like, a way of saying this is the Keystone World. You know what I mean? Like, okay. this is the... At least and that, that's... Oh, my God. I think no, I that nailed that, sense. but, like, yeah. It's, I think you did, very, too, because he even yeah. says the rose might be a portal to all times everywhere all times and all places everywhere um so it's like when they're in the keystone world there seems to be like not just a door to a place or a time but like potentially the doors can be used as uh doors to all places and all times everywhere oh what did you think speaking of the rose what did you think about that part where uh don callahan like goes to go see the rose you know because it's just singing in that whole area and then that hippie comes up and talks to him. he's like man <laughs> isn't this rad like this this one spot this man, is I had the place, bad acne man and i just kept coming back here my face cleared up this place is awesome i thought that was pretty cool yeah. well i like the fact that there's also you know like the the thinny is a representation of like a thinning between the worlds and this creature that's like but that's like a bad one Whereas the rose seems to kind of represent and like that plot of land seems to seems to show that there are places where there's doorways or gateways or perhaps even a thinning of between times and places that are positive, that are good, um, that are yeah. actual not perversions, you know? Yeah, that's an interesting way of thinking about it for sure. Yeah, yeah though it is interesting that the rose is in a lot of like a broken down, uncompleted construction project. You know, there's something... Well, I mean, there the, and that uh, it's not finished. I think I might be able to, to tell you what that's all about. Okay. At least in my mind, this is what I think is like everything everything in this particular instance uh, seems to be like working on some sort of like opposites or twin opposites or whatever. Like the rose is in a vacant lot filled with garbage, right? And right. The tower is in a field of roses. Oh, so okay. it's kind of like that i mean that's how i look at it. it's the like, tower it's like, might be the garbage and no <laughs> it's like the it's like a yin yang you know it's weird this, totally. this shit okay. is so spacey <laughs> dude it gets real spacey i really like more the, spacey uh, buddy yeah, yeah hold on dude, hold I'm, on to your your army your yamaka I'm, I'm in for it man i really like the the whole cave um the door cave or whatever and all of the dead people who keep attacking out of the oh, darkness who keep like trying to yeah, yeah. yell and stuff and I, I just really like that as a way to like remind you it was like a way of letting us inside the minds of our characters and their deepest darkest insecurities and the things that they're struggling with without like literally taking us in there and being like he was struggling with this thought totally. you know it was like a just a really cool way of showing us like ah this person struggles with this and this person from his past you know yeah like um poor eddie just can't shake henry the uh, the great sage the great sage and eminent junkie you know <laughs> yes. can't shake him it sucks you know like yeah. you, just, you just bring that kind of stuff with you everywhere you go and like callahan is his mom you know mm -hmm. and and you know that could be a good thing too it could be used to remind you of of who you were and who you don't want to be so you know if used properly it can be a a benefit not a a weakness but certainly it does get inside his head a few times uh, yeah i mean like in, if you're already ways. super stressed out that's not gonna yeah. help <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like, having like already... someone you loved and respected be like you're always a piece and you're never yeah. gonna become more <laughs> yeah i really love sometimes how stephen king just doesn't try to even be kind of subtle like he's just like <laughs> so, like like the characters names are the hitler brothers yeah. like, <laughs> they're just like yep okay cool not wasting any time by not understanding they're bad they're bad yep uh and it's just kind of nice sometimes because just like Jake's father having a middle initial for a name that means nothing, that is not even an initial. It's just his middle name is that letter. Uh, <laughs> some things just are what they are. There's not deeper meaning in them, and he doesn't waste any time just being like, ta-da. Also, there were multiple blue chambray shirts in this story. Yeah, I was wondering if you were going to notice those as I oh, was Oh, yeah, reading. there was two at least that I remember. <laughs> he loves his blue chambray shirts. Loves just them, can't, man. Can't get enough of them. Did you notice that Don Callahan gave the Hitler brothers um, nicknames? <clears throat> no. Lenny what and were George. They? Oh, Lenny and George. What significance is that? Uh, they're the main characters in Of Mice and Men. Oh, wow. I don't know. It's just... That's obscure. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that obscure. It's a pretty popular I mean, book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it is. But yeah, yeah, just, yeah. That's a good Easter egg right there. Um, okay, so 
I feel like the idea of the toe dash just kind of came out of nowhere, and it's like, ta-da, we have toe dashes now. Well, I mean, it's because there's it's because of their proximity to Black Thirteen. Okay, and also yeah. like the mushrooms that they ate that were like not special mushrooms, so, and Roland's okay, like, it's... so these won't make you trip out, but it's like a different type of thing. But that thing means actually you're gonna go there when you're asleep and be well, literally there. So you know, because like I think that that kind of tripped me out a little bit too the first time I was reading this because yeah. they ate those mushrooms. And then they did go toe dash, but the toe dash wasn't because of the mushrooms. It's because of Black Thirteen. So I don't know. Oh. That was odd. I, and I could be wrong about that, but I'm I'm pretty sure I'm right. Like huh. it's yeah, because it did happen what. the night that they ate them, and it seems yeah. to be like a like causal relationship. But maybe yeah, it not. does seem that way too. And especially because like um, Susanna wanders off, and you're like, well, maybe she's just like yeah, she's, she's peeking over there, you know. But like that's yeah, not she's it either. Super you know? <laughs> She's maybe it was maybe it was like a certain kind of like <clears throat> like catalyst that opened them up to be more like um receptive right, like it put them in a mind that. state yeah, yeah okay yeah yeah that's that's kind of how i took it but it did seem a little like wait like and and if that was the case it did seem like a woefully inadequate like warning by roland where it was like no no it won't make you trip out but like <laughs> it might make you have like vivid dreams and like if that means like yeah those dreams might literally carry you to a place in time where like you are actually there like that seems pretty pretty much a, a large inadequacy of a uh, warning there from <laughs> <Mole> Roland. <laughs> all right so we're gonna start wrapping up here pretty soon i, I think we're, we're covering most of the high points of this yeah, book I think so. and um i wanted to ask you this is gonna be my last question well no i've got two more questions uh, okay. one, of them, one of those is a basically useless question but i'll ask you the good question first um what do you think is up with the 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 chap mia's kid mia daughter of nuns baby like what do you what do you think is up with all of that man as i've said and i'll say again to predict anything in these books is almost just a foolish and waste of time because who even knows what the mind the twisted place that is the mind of stephen king is going to take us but if i had to guess i don't think because it can't all be the incubus right it has to be part Susanna as well and Susanna is not all bad so I think it's going to be something that is used to forward the tale that isn't all bad you know like they're kind of worried about this thing like eating her yeah. upon being born and I don't think it's going to do that mm-hmm. nor do I think it's going to try or maybe it will but it's going to like just like Susanna have a divided mind where occasionally she's at war with herself Um, It might have that sort of complex going on, which would be apropos considering its mother. Um, And I think in the end, it'll choose to help our cocktail out and, and maybe not uh, survive and make it, but sacrifice itself for the the betterment of all, all kind and to get our cocktail back together and closer to the tower. That's my hope. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think we're not giving the baby enough of a, enough, uh, (laughs) enough credit you know i think it's because it's totally. half susanna too you know all right uh this is going to be my last question and okay. then we're going to start wrapping things up and i just have to ask this because i ask it at the end of every episode but like what do you think is going to happen in song of susanna uh, susanna is let me set the scene here susanna is gone gone she's preg preggers with an incubus baby or what seem what appears to be an incubus baby that wouldn't be crazy um, if it was just eddie's all along <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not eddie's yeah I can, yeah no, it's, definitely it's confirmed not basically in this uh you know she's, totally. she's not she's not getting her period it's um it's or no she is still getting her period i should say um yeah well so what do you what do you think is gonna what do you think this next book is Wait, gonna she be is about? still getting her period yeah yeah that's a, even with some, having the baby yeah yeah oh weird okay yeah, so it's like that's like a that. I must have missed that. Yeah. yeah. Um, for some reason, I thought that it said that she wasn't, but I guess that must be like an indicator of like, this is not a human baby because she's know. still getting her See. period. Got it. Okay. Um, well, okay. Here's what I hope doesn't happen. I hope that we don't <laughs> spend the whole next book trying to find Susanna. I hope that they get connected pretty soon. And like, yes, the whole book can be about fixing the problem that is created by um, like, the baby incubus baby that is going to become come out of her and be like a demon child or something like that's fine with me, but I don't want it to be like, a, we're just searching for her the whole next book. 
What do you think is going to happen with the Rose and Calvin Tower and the Sombra Corporation, uh, Rico Balazar, the vacant Calvin lot? Calvin Tower is going to die. Hmm. He's going to die, I think. He's too dumb <laughs> and cares about his books too much. But before he does that, he will either either his books or him or him using his books will reveal some very important piece of information, perhaps a key to like get into the tower or something that will allow them to find the tower or something um, that will, that will get them get our quartet closer to the tower. But I think it will be the, the last thing that old old Calvin does. Interesting. Or maybe, maybe, maybe Calvin tower is, a bad guy and he's playing everybody. I don't know. I don't know. I got a, I got a hint that he's like maybe more than he's telling us. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm just wanting him to be something more than he is. I think we're he's just going to have to read he's it. An annoying character. <laughs> we're just going to have to read song of Susanna. I kind of want to go read it right now. I think it's, I want to uh, go read it right now too. Yeah. Everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode on book five in the dark tower series. We are one step closer to the nexus of all realities one oh, member of boy. our quartet down to be found before we can go fix all space time mia mia, MIA yeah. yeah definitely but everybody thank you so much for listening hope you have an awesome rest of your day and of course happy reading bye everybody